now coming on the show, we have former U.S. men's national team defender Jay Demerit. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, Jay. I really appreciate you coming on the show. My pleasure. Always a pleasure to be here. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm really excited to hear your story um, today and ask you some questions about your career because it definitely, I mean, it wasn't easy for you to get to the point you did. Like you really had to grind and fight and scrap and your determination and persistence really uh, inspired me as a player and it still does today as a person. I mean, not many players have taken the path that you did to rise to the top and that's something that I, I really respect. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I guess, what have you been up to nowadays? I know you're really involved in, um, in fundraisers, and you just recently started one of your own, correct? That's right, yeah. I mean, uh, those of you that don't know my story, uh, it can be learned very quickly from, from Rise and Shine, which is a documentary film that was made about uh, my story in 2011 after the World Cup in 2010. Uh, it was a Kickstarter project that thousands of people donated their money to turn into a documentary film called rise and shine. And, um, it's, it, it's, it's something for me that I now live through rise and shine is a charity. It's a fundraiser music festival and it's a youth program. So what we do at rise and shine is, you know, we teach believe in it stories that kids can now believe in their own. So again, we, we, we personify professionals that have made it in their own fields from chefs to designers, to edu entrepreneurs, to, you know, again, professional athletes like myself. So, we, we personify those into lessons. We, I, I live up in the mountains of Canada. I finished my career as the, the captain of the Whitecaps in, in mm -hmm. Vancouver. So I still live in, in Canada, up in BC. Um, and this is like a camp out soccer camp. And, and we also have a DJ program. But in the end, it's, it's a youth program. It's a leadership program. And so I do a lot of that. Uh, again, the fundraisers that we run. So we do a lot of events. Those, uh, those feed the program so that we, we get kids that come to camp for free, paid for by the fundraisers. Uh, so we get kids from all sorts of communities, all sorts of, uh, you know, deserving kids from all walks of life. Um, and so that, that kind of really creates the social environment for me that I want to create. It's kids that register because they want to be better players and leaders. And then there's kids that don't have that opportunity normally. And mm -hmm. when you mix that socially and, and you surround it with cool people like, that are designers, doctors, you know, entrepreneurs and athletes, you know, great things can happen and, and great yeah. mindsets can be shared. And and, and, and again, I think one of my one of my real messages of Rise and Shine, it's not a soccer story, it's a life story. And and that truly is, is my message. And that's why I love that you can say even now you can take some of the teachings or at least lessons of, of my story into your own life now. And, and, and that is the whole point. You know, this isn't a sports story. It's a, it's a life story and, and, and rise and shine is a mentality. It's a way, it's a way of thought. It's a, it's a, it's a lifestyle. And, 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 uh, and I think that that is truly what my passion is now and purpose is, is to, is to try to tell that story to as many people as, as I can. And, and again, so again, thank you for, for having, uh, having me today to, to allow myself to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I really appreciate you, you, you doing this, Jay. It means a lot. Um, so I guess let's just start from the beginning. Uh, I read that in high school, you played soccer, basketball, and ran track uh, up in Wisconsin for the Bayport Pirates. Um, <laughs> Go Pirates. <laughs> you were, I mean, you were clearly an athlete, but, you know, was it in high school? Like, was soccer your number one sport? You know, was it in high school when you realized, like, okay, you know, this soccer is where, you know, I can kind of make it far? Yeah, I, I think I, I think when, you, when you're in that, choice of opportunity is kind of where I call it like your 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 lanes of opportunity and, and that's kind of where I was in high school again I was from Green Bay so I wasn't from a big school or a, you know playing in, in like ODP programs you know I wasn't I wasn't one of those kids that came through development programs um, like and I know that's a little bit different now um, as I probably would have because there's just more of them um, but that being said I, I really appreciate the fact that I wasn't uh, again I played basketball ran track um, when I got to 18, again, I looked at choices. I had one college scholarship offer from UW Green Bay. So my job, but my scholarship was to play D1 soccer in my hometown, which wasn't really something I wanted to do, knowing who I was. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was, I was looking to get out of it. Um, and I had a D3 basketball scholarship. Hmm. So I was like D3, but I, it, was, it was to a smaller Wisconsin school. And again, my opportunities were, uh, were, were few, but at the end of the day, my high school coach, because I was a college, you know, a high school player that did other things. And, and, and I, my, I was from uh, both my parents are gym teachers and educators. So, you know, I've always kind of had this mindset of to ask questions and to be, you know, talked to. 
you know, when you have educators as parents, most teachers or mentors, they always ask, just ask questions. Yeah. So w within that, you, you learn how to ask questions. And I think when that really helped with my development and, and, and when I became a high school senior, my coach who was the former UW Green Bay coach. So again, the only university in my town, it was a 60 year old Italian guy who happened to be my high school coach. So he says, I got a friend down in Chicago. It's the same conference and level as UW Green Bay. But if you want to get out of town, I'll call him and see if he'll, you know, he'll take a chance on you. So again, because I was a player that, that somebody wanted to take a chance on, he called and was like, hey, I got a kid up here. See what you got for him. And so they gave me a $2,000 scholarship <laughs> to, go down, to go down to Chicago. Yeah. But again, my mindset was, I want, to, I want to challenge myself to bigger environments. I don't want to be a big fish in a small pond. Not to say that you can't be. That's, that's definitely what choice is and, and, and what our journey speak to it is. But again, my journey to me and that spoke to me was, you know, I want to challenge myself against good players. I think I could be, you know, a better player. And if I go to the big city, Chicago, of course, being from the Midwest, Chicago is kind of the main hotbed for where good players go. I'm sure Dallas is that for where you guys are. You know what I mean? Like that, that's kind of the level where I was at. And I was like... Ooh, like I wasn't recruited again. I'm from Wisconsin from a small town. So again, that was the big challenge and my kind of my choice, but I was like, yeah. Secondly, about the opportunity, it was like, okay, now let's look at what they do for school, you know, and, and they had a design program that I wanted to go to because my brother who was older, he had a, a roommate that was a design student. I would, I would look at his drawings or look at his cool graphic design projects or, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, I just thought that from a school perspective, again, cause I had no idea at that time that I would be a professional soccer player. You know what I mean? That wasn't in yeah. my mind yet. Um, it wasn't there yet. So it was like, how can I be a good college athlete? So, and again, I think that's important to people's journeys is, is understanding the big picture is that, I did not believe that I couldn't be one. I just didn't think that it was in my mind at the time. So it was like one of those things where I think we manage small goals, but still with an eye on the bigger one. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that's kind of was built into my code from the start of when I left town for the first time. And, and when I was there, I, I, I first understood what that was like, you know, a fish out of water, big city lights, like, holy, you know what I mean? Like that was a bit of a transition for me, but it would definitely, I felt, it felt right. It felt like is where I wanted to be. And, and, and I think I got used to that feeling of like, I'm in a place where I really want to be, but I understand I'm on the bottom step of the ladder. Yeah. If you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and I guess uh, over time, and, and again, as we tell the story, that's kind of what happened. And um, I've always kind of relished those opportunities. I've kind of understood that being uncomfortable is something that I, I really, I really felt in order to, uh, to grow as, as a person and, and, and evolve your, yourself to be the best version of you. You do have to do that. You have to purposely put yourself out of comfort. Yeah. And you have to purposely, you know, believe in yourself when, when no one else believes in your vision. I think that's all part of like a real journey, like a real, like, how do you get the most out of, out of your journey? It starts with like that scenario. How do I put myself in that? And Chicago was my first time. And, 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 uh, and then I was a university student. I was a D1 athlete. So I was stoked. Um, I was challenging myself, but again, what happened next was interesting that I, I got recruited as a, as a forward. So I, again, I was 18 years right. old. I scored a bunch of goals and, you know, I had that built into me. And then in the first preseason tournament, my freshman year, the coach calls me in and he, we have a, we have a red card and an injury to two of the players. And he asked me if I wanted to play defense. You know, <laughs> I, you know, we talk about ego a lot in sports and, you know, forwards are more of an ego based position. Mm. And I think that, you know, that was like my first kind of real, real, okay. These are decisions that may, may help or hurt you. Yeah. So, you know, for me, I was kind of weighing up those ideas. And then I, again, I, you go back to kind of humility positions and I was like, okay, I'm a freshman. I want to play. I want an opportunity to show that I'm, I could be good enough. And I've never tried to play defender before. So I guess I'm not wrong. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, again, maybe he sees something in me that I see. And I think that again is something that we can all take into life of being coachable is that like, we have to respect people's opinions of what they think of us caring about them later is is another story but accepting them and going hmm i'll take that on board for a second i'll weigh up the scenarios good bads uglies and then i'll make a decision based on all those things but the decision to say like somebody else saw that my athleticism or maybe my competitive built into preseason or maybe that i wasn't a very good soccer player yet and we played a marking back system and he's a good athlete mm -hmm. so let's go ask him if he wants to play yeah right but again the fact that he was willing to ask me made me have a little bit of confidence to be like, all right, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. 
and, and, and I guess, you know, again, in, in, in the famous end of that story is that in three games, I knew that for 19, 18 years, I've been playing out of position. Wow. You, you know what I mean? So, and, and, and again, from that, I became the starting defender my freshman year. And by the time I was a sophomore, you know, I was, I was getting all regional team and division one universities. And by the end of my college career, I was, I was honorable mention all American for, you know, coming from nowhere. That's a good chunk of results. <laughs> All because I decided to say yes to yeah. somebody that got me out of my comfort zone, even in my own identity. So that's kind of that, that kind of started this whole idea of that too. Yeah, um, that's that's amazing. It's like, you know, if you would have, you know, earlier on played as a defender, I imagine imagine how much better you could have been right when you got to college rather than just getting thrown right into that position, you know? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, again, I think, I think another trait we all have to learn is how to learn fast and, and yeah. you know, like throw myself or throwing anyone their self, themselves into any, you know, swim or sink or swim moment, um, which we all have in our lives in, in, in a different definition. Um, it's the willingness to go out there and paddle, you know, whether you know what you're doing or not, I think is, 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 is part of it. And mm -hmm. I knew I was a good athlete. I knew what I could, I knew I could compete. I'd played again. I had had three weeks of preseason with these guys. I knew I was a little bit out of my element, but I knew that if I just stayed in my lane and, and, and competed and tried to disrupt people and win headers and, you know, do what I knew I was good at, even it transferred to a defensive position. Yeah. That, that, I'll just start with that. And, and, mm -hmm. and that's what happened. And, and it really just became one of those key moments in my life where, you know, things started to get better. Yeah. Right. Um, so I know there you guys won a couple of conference championships and then you all went to the NCAA tournament. I mean, overall, how how would you describe your experience playing college soccer and for you know University of Illinois in Chicago? How how was that for you? Uh, I I think college is is an incredible experience on all sorts of ways. You know, like I I totally understand academy systems. Again, I I, I played many years in in England and and in their youth team mm -hmm. started with nine years old. So I, I I get the I get both sides of the education system when it comes to sport and education. Again, I'm not a product of the of academies, so I'm a product of college, and I, and I know how much that experience helped me become a better professional in the end. Um, so I I really valued my college experience. Again, I think uh, soccer and playing sports in college alone, or college alone as an, as an experience, is it's it's social, it's time management, it's uh, again a refinement of of what I like, who I am. You know what I mean? All that kind of stuff is such an important part of the journey of, 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 of understanding what you want to do and who you want to be. And, um, you know, college experience for me was, was, was incredible. And, and I looked to that I looked to the teamwork types of things where I learned how to be a better leader. You know what I mean? As you grow as a, as a, as a college player, but I'm leading guys in a locker room because I'm a better player by the end of my career, Yeah. you know, by being like a, a freshman that, you know, gets put in a locker, you know what I mean? <laughs> that experience alone is, is, is that social experience. That's hierarchy. That's, that's things that are real. You know what I mean? And again, I always talk about like how metaphors in sport are metaphors for life or listeners that actually don't play sports. But, you know, at the end of the day, these are very common, common themes in, in any, in any journey to get professional at what you do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, college was a great stepping stone of that. But I look at that time in my life as a really important way for me to figure out how to be smarter socially, time management wise, and, and how to understand who I was better to prepare myself for the next journey. And that was how to pack a backpack with 1500 bucks and, <laughs> and, and, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and move to England and live in your friend's attic and crawl through a hole and sleep on a mattress. You know, that was my next journey, but it took yeah. a college degree. I took a college degree in design and a four year college education as a division one athletes for me to make that decision. And I think that experience gave me the confidence to do so. Yep. Because I, I, I had gone to school, I knew enough about myself to know that I could be good enough to play pro. I was in conversations in America with a very limited story. I had three years of experience at a high level of soccer. You know, my sophomore, junior, and senior year were the only times I trained every day and I actually paid attention to the sport. So, but again, scouts don't look at that. Scouts don't look at that. They look at my academy experience, check mark zero. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my change of position, is he a polished defender? Check mark, probably not. You know what I mean? Like I get it. Like I under, but yeah. again, when we understand ourselves and our story, we can make our own decisions then. 
I'm not relying on sc- college scout A and B because I know they're looking at the dudes from Stanford and Clemson. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I think we have to understand that about our own stories and where we're at. But part of that takes a humility to be critical of yourself. You know, most people are like, yeah, fuck that. I'll get drafted. Yeah. But if I don't get drafted, then I failed. But if I go in going, I probably won't get drafted because of this reason, this reason, this reason. Yeah, you got nothing to lose. Why, exactly. Why am I surprised when I don't get drafted? You know, that's like the, oh, that's the failure. But it's not, really. It's just there's reasons. And, and again, if you can take those reasons on with the, I know I have a lot of work to do. I know if I get a shot at the pros, I'll be the last in the ladder. But still, having the belief system that I could get there was kind of where I was when I mm-hmm. moved to England. Yeah. Um, and did you – did you get drafted by the Chicago fire and then they put you on their USL team? Um, or how did no, I, I was on their USL team almost got drafted by them, but didn't they? Ended okay. Up got you. Them. Got it. Um, so I got how, offered to go back to the PDL team mm. to, to, to do that. But at the same time, you know, again, you weigh up going back to a PDL team or do you have an opportunity to go live in England with your friend and start playing in the bottom rings there but still like I know my light at the end of the tunnel in America at the time was dim because I know developmental players that I knew from the PDL days was like 18 grand a year contract sewn up for four years and playing in USL which again the future isn't that bright because even a first year MLS contract is 40 you know what I mean so it's like if I'm looking at even monetary value I go be a designer out of college with my degree and I'll make 40 so again Money, money wasn't really a huge priority for me. It was yeah. an opportunity. You know, how do I create it? And then that was kind of like what allowed me to go to England. Because I'm like, either way, I got it the hard way. Either way, I got to start at the bottom of the ladder. So why don't I just do it in a place where the light at the end of the tunnel is so much brighter? Yeah. And the experience to go live in England, the, you know, the, the, one of the founding fathers of soccer. You know what I mean? Why not yeah. do that? Learn yeah. some experience. Play in the crappy leagues and try to figure it out. Yeah. I mean – how long, how long did you play in the, UC, the USL before you decided, you know what, screw it, let's, let's try it, and you moved to England? Uh, two years in the PDL. So my junior yeah, yeah. and senior year of university at, in Chicago, I played PDL. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then that kind of, again, there was whispers of pros. I had a couple of potential walk-on stuff. But, again, it's still the same bottom of the ladder. Yeah. You know, and it's a lot of those things. And I'm, you know, anyone that knows my story, I'm a life experience guy too. You know, I want to uh, – I want to travel around and go to Amsterdam and hang out. And, you know yeah. what I mean? like, I'm not one of those guys. You know what I mean? I want to, I, I live life and the full throttle, but mm-hmm. you know, that opportunity lend me that too. And again, I, we have to listen to ourselves and what we feel and who we are, you know, again, based on our experience. And then for me, that experience to go to England, even though I knew it'd be even tougher mm-hmm. it, for me, it was just like, it just made more sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, t- like, tell me about, you know, kind of like your thought process, you know, like what made you just do it? Cause like you said, I mean, you only had $1,500 when you went over there. I mean, I'm sure people thought you were crazy when you decided you wanted to do it. Yeah. Well, the first question I was asked is like, you're, you're from America. What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're trying to play soccer here and you're an American. Why don't you play soccer there? Yeah. You know what I mean? If you haven't made it there, how are you going to make it here? But again, like, I get the theory, but, you know, again, I started to play against guys at that level. And I knew in one game that I was good enough to play in English 12th division. You know what I mean? I was. Yeah. I was good enough to play. You know, right. you, tell, you, know, you know how to monitor your performances. I knew, I knew that I was good enough to play in that. Very, and guess what? One of the two of the guys that played for that 12th division team three years earlier were playing for QPR in Wales. Hmm. You know what I mean? So again, yeah. like, these are guys that I can now play with, even if it's at that lower level. And again, I was making 40 bucks in an envelope, 40 pounds. And I was playing in the 12th division in front of four, four people. You know what I mean? Like I was one hell of a college graduate. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not exactly the, the glamour, the glamorous uh, situation you want to find yourself in, you know, as a 23 year old person. But yeah. at the end of the day, I was, I loved it. I, I really did. And all of a sudden I play against that dude and I'm like, Whoa, this dude was playing in the first division three years ago. Okay. I, I, if, and if you give me that, if you give me three years to be that guy, I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. So again, that, that's the mindset. It, it, it's like, okay, I can see that that guy is only three out, three years out of pro. I know that I'm three years out of pro potentially, or at least in my mindset, I was, mm-hmm. you know, I knew I wasn't just going to land on English shores and be like, yo, Chelsea, give me a tryout. You know, yeah. I, know I know that's not going to happen. 
And I didn't even have that in my brain. It was, how do I get to the ninth division? How do I get to the third? How do I get to the second? You know what I mean? I knew the path. And again, you start in the 12th, you monitor your performances. It took me probably three or four games to start. And again, I was a sub. So then by three or four games of training and, and being in the environment, then I was like, okay, we'll start Jay. Finally, I'm a starter. By the end of that season, I'm getting looks. I'm getting third division ass. I got a buddy that's a scout. He's like, hey, I'm starting to shop you from teams. Things are getting pretty cool. Like, again, I'm, I go to a trial for a team called Oxford United. It's a third yeah. division team. Mm-hmm. Again, I, I don't know if it was in – yeah, was, I think it was in Rise and Shine. We, we talked about that story. And, and, and I, I spend my 20 bucks to get there on a, in the car. Me and the guy that I was with were both, you know, pitched in 20 bucks. We were both accepted to this tryout for a third division team. We get in there. We, we sit on the bench for 87 minutes. And they put us in the 87th minute. We walked out. I maybe pushed the D up once, and they blew the whistle. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, yeah. what? You know what I mean? Like, that's it? that's what I get. That's all this work. You know what I mean? And that's kind of one of the punches in the face that you kind of receive at times in your journey where you think you're there and then you're not. Um, but I very, very quickly shifted the mindset to at the beginning of the season, you were playing in the 12th division and now you're getting a third division tryout. I, again, I could look to that tryout as I had my big shot and I failed. Mm-hmm. I could do that. It's yeah. very easy. Everyone else would probably think the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, well, you got your shot, though, Jay. Good job. Way to, way to go. You made it, kind of. You know what I mean? Like, that's what yeah. most people would say, or had did say it to me at the time. But I was thinking, no, this is my first chance. Like, this, at least I'm there. Now I'm in that room. There's no reason I can't get another tryout. Mm-hmm. If I got one, I, why can't I get more? Yeah. And that's what happened. I got, I, got, I, I got a tryout with another team. This now, you know, fast forward to the next preseason. Um, and and, and, the, and the, we, I'm at a ninth division team, and they are, uh, so three rings up. And I got recruited there because they have Watford in a preseason friendly. He's like, you know, and I, I knew the coach because he was, he knew me from the 12th division days. He's like, come here, you can play against Watford. You never know. Yeah. But again, I looked at it as my one chance to play against a first division team. This is by the story. What happens? I play against that team by chance. They are, again, our t- timing of our stories is important. They didn't have any player, any money to buy new players. And sure enough, they're looking for a center back. I play against their first team again, starting first division forwards. I compete, I win things in the air, I disrupt their rhythms, I get in their way, I'm a, I'm a nuisance like I, like I always was. And, mm-hmm. and that was, that was well, again, what I knew what to do in those types of games, was just do what you're good at yeah. and let the, game, let the game fall into place. And that carried on to everything, even in, into World Cup finals. And, 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 and that was my first chance of doing that. And that coach was like, who's that guy? And they're like, <laughs> yeah. oh, he's this guy that's been like, you know, making 40 bucks for a year. But again, that's all you need sometimes but again i mm-hmm. had the confidence to play well against that team because i had had a third division trial i was in the conversations to play pro it was something i could take confidence into and sure enough that's that's what happened and i got a, i got my trial with the first team and uh, uh at wofford which is again london suburb again way a step up but mm-hmm. yeah, now i got my chance to get my foot in that door and, and that's what happened got it um so your first season with Watford was uh, 2004, 2005. Um, how long did it take you to adapt to the speed and intensity of the game? Um, probably, I'm going to say a half a season. Um, I got, the good thing was, is that I didn't really get my appearances until the end half of that first season. Um, my first year I ended up playing 30 games, almost 30 games. Mm-hmm. And that's really rare for a rookie again, more, especially yeah. one that has no experience. Um, but again, the center half position and the cool thing about being in, in, in the higher performance leagues is that the higher you go, the more you just have to concentrate on your position. So again, my position as a defender, a marker, a header, a competitor would have been no different than if I was playing against a 12th division guy and a first division guy. Yeah like where my skill sets were. So I guess that allowed me to adapt a little bit faster maybe than some of the others because my core skill sets were more athletic and competitive based than skill set based. And what it, what it took me a six months to, or, or at least 20 games to do was the calmness to get the ball and pass it to somebody and keep it. That was my, that was my, what I lacked when I had, and again, I never even got that great at that, but what I did was got good enough at it. Yeah where it still allowed me to get picked to be a starter. 
because I knew those other intangibles were good enough to match the best players, whether they were Ronaldo or some dude from the dog and duck United, you know what I mean? Like yep. it was the same. And, and again, I think I understood that about my, my game and, and what I brought to the table as a, as a, as a player. And I think that allowed me to adapt faster, but it took me about a half a season and about, you know, again, I think as, as a, it's all, I think a lot of this adaptation is, is position-based. So, again, for, right. for me as a, as a center back, there are probably maybe, you know, just off the top of my head, five different types of forwards that I need to learn how to play against. Your short, fast guys, your big, tall guy, your muscly guy, your strong guy, your wiry guy, your step-over guy. You know, these are different, these are different platforms of forwards I'm going to play against. Yeah. But I had to yeah. play against them at least once or twice, that type of player, to start to understand that I could play them. Do you know what I mean? Each new, mm -hmm. each new time was, it was a learning experience of how to play with, against guys at that level. So I think it took me playing against each of those guys a couple times. And again, I think one, one big broad stroke thing to journey stories is that you have to learn fast. If you're going to climb ladders, you can't make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Otherwise, you'll just stay where you are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that goes for jobs. That goes for how do you climb up management. You know what I mean? If, if somebody, if a boss tells you don't make that mistake, and you keep making it, they're not going to make you go higher or somebody else isn't going to buy you or pick you. So again, I think learning fast was something that I really had to do. Um, and I think that's a high performance trait. And, and so, you know, I only, I only needed two or three times to play against the big strong guy to learn, to learn how to, I, to gain advantage from the big strong guy. So if yeah. you know what I mean, so I would say, yeah, to answer the question again, very well roundedly uh, about a half a season. Got it. Um, then just going back a little bit, um, how did Division One college soccer compare with the twelfth and ninth tier of English football? Like, could your Division One team have competed in the ninth tier? I think so. I, I think it's probably similar to a, to a decent college college program. Um, I always look at it as like if the championship is kind of like high MLS. Yeah, you know the, the 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 professional leagues are kind of high MLS. You get down to like fourth division, third division. It's probably low MLS, um, and then you get to kind of good college programs or like fourth division as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of like your good college programs is kind of like that kind of sixth to seventh to kind of fifth, like that kind of area. Yeah, Got the twelfth division even in the twelfth division, guys are still make, they still get paid, right. You know what I mean? Like even in the 12th division, like 40 pounds isn't a lot, but you know, if you're a good player on those teams, you get a hundred, 200 bucks a game. You know what I mean? Like, that's not a bad thing. Plus you have another job. Like they're still good players. It's still worth yeah. it You know what I mean? for them to come out and play. So there's, and again, the concentration of people, and this is what makes England interesting as well. Like I always tell people from America or North America that it's like putting the whole of the NFL in, 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 in Washington and then like splitting Washington in half having two teams in Seattle that each have 50,000 seat stadiums and each of them hate each other. <laughs> like what that looks like. And then, and then each team gets to promote it and really get relegated to the league above and below. But again, yeah. if you look at geography and the fanaticism and how every season is different, that's where you get the fanaticism of what European soccer is like, or South American soccer is like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's fanatical. So, you know, I would, I would say that's a little bit different too. It's just there's totally. it's a lot, and I know that's been said a lot about the MLS from foreign players that come here. Is that there, there's not much pressure because not at all. like if you lose, you're not gonna you have fans outside throwing bottles at your house, like you know what I mean, like stuff like that, it, it, or the pressure to like feel it in the stands, or like you know what I mean. Only a couple places create that. Yeah, and uh, I, I think in England that in, in in those type of that that really adds to the experience, but it's definitely not for the faint of heart. That's for sure. Yeah um definitely yeah tons of pressure over there i'm sure um but that first season uh, with watford you guys were pretty close to getting relegated right in that 2005 yeah 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 and that's when yeah. ad booth was, so we were we were you know, right. close to getting relegated and and then the new preseason started and we were picked to get relegated because we and then we they hired a new manager. He was the youngest manager in the league. He was thirty four years old. Sorry, he was thirty four and the youngest manager in professional European soccer. No way. And he was he was the youth director at Leeds, Leeds United, big club, okay. but like youth director, zero professional coaching experience. <laughs> and he can I'll, I'll remember this is part of the famous stories of like he walked into our his first meeting with again thirty guys in the room probably five of them five five or more of them way more if you include the staff 
were older than he was. <laughs> so if you think about what that's like to walk in as a boss and be like, yo, this is my team. And you four over there, you four veteran players that have 15, 20 years of professional experience. Uh, you're four years older than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> think about that dynamic. But he very famously said, he said to the whole room that, you know, with the talent in this room, I believe that by the end of this season, we will be minimum playoff contenders, maximum be promoted to the Premier League with this, with this group. And we all looked at him like he was like Marvin the Martian, dude. Like, it was like this whole idea, like, what? Yeah. Who is this cowboy, young, young punk that just comes in here and thinks that he's going to get promoted to the Premier League? You got dudes got, you know, again, you could see the, you know, the leaders in the room, like, crossing their arms and being like, what is going on with this guy? But at the end of the day, he very, we very quickly changed our minds. And, and, and again, this was because of his management skills. And he just had this raw enthusiasm about himself. He had this kind of raw leadership ability to understand us as individuals. He always did this famous thing where every, every day after training, he took one guy, put his arm around him and walked him around a lap of the training field just so he could create a connection, ask yeah. him questions. It's a family guy. Oh, how's your family? You know, how are your kids? How's your, and I learned a lot about his leadership traits from that. And, and you know, you know, while his arm around me was like, dude, you walked here, man. Like, great job. I, I can't believe you're here. I know your story. Mm -hmm. That's really great. You know what I mean? And, but my challenge for you is now, what do you want to do? You've mm -hmm. come this far, but do you think you've made it? Do you think that you, you know, what else do you want out of your season? You ended up playing 30 games as a rookie, dude. That's, that's really great. But what do you want to do? You know, you want to become mm -hmm. a starter. Do you want to become a leader on this team? You know, what's your goals? And, you know, that starts with the man management of why like a Pep Guardiola is incredible because when you're a manager, you have to manage egos big time, especially yeah. at that level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was, he was the first guy that really I saw do that, even though he was one of the youngest guys I've seen do that. Um, I, I watched it happen. And then all of a sudden those meeting rooms became our place. It was communicative. It was, this isn't my team. It's our team. We did this thing called the circle mentality where every Sunday after our Saturday games, we'd come in and 30 chairs would be in a circle. And we would talk to each other and, 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 and create communication exercises where we could have a goal with each other. And it was my fault on that goal. Or I thought you should have done this. Or, coach, I thought you made the subs too late. You know what I mean? I thought in the 88th minute, it's too late to make a sub. You know, like he was open to those discussions. But as a group and as leaders, like we all learned a lot about each other and learned our characters and what, what we bring to the team. And by the end of that season, we were in the position of playoffs. And by the end of that season, you know, again, I was a starter. I was a purposeful player. And, uh, and then that got us to the playoff final and, and, yep. and playoff final again to set that stage was, you know, us against, again, infamously leads the guy, the, the team where AD Boothroyd came from, yeah. as the director, you know, and again, but playoff finals is the most lucrative game in professional sports, not just yep. professional soccer. It's because the TV money in, in, in the Premier League is so high because the whole world watches it. Um, the, the, the step up from the championship to the Premier League is like now a hundred million dollars to the winner of that of that game so it, you think about the implications but the i think when we won it was a 40 40 or 50 million pounds which is like 80 80 million dollars so i got the players don't really see a ton of that but that allows the budget to buy new players to try to stay in the premier league and create our marketing campaigns for your club and like you know again because now you're now you're in the best league and the biggest league in the world yeah and so again the implications of that game were crazy and again this is my second season so i'm like I don't really, still don't really know what I'm doing, but I, I also know that I'm a good enough player to deserve that, that spot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And again, I always kind of relish those roles and really appreciate the opportunity to be in them. And I think, um, I think that's kind of what we all felt like. He had kind of uh, built this team of like old bears. Like the guy I played with was a guy named Malky Mackay. He was like a 35 year old Scottish guy, great leader, great communicator. And then he was my compliment. So he was like, big guy not that fast you know but really complicated my like ability to work my yeah. competitive edge my ability to cover in behind him and I think AD really did that all around the field like where we had like positions and the people in that room really complement each other and because of that circle and because we learned so much about each other we really appreciated all of those relationships as players mm -hmm. and we just ran the whole playoffs and then ran into that game and again 20 minutes in, they go up on a corner kick. I, I, I famously score the first goal yeah. off a corner kick. I wrap around because we were so prepared as a group to know that they would have been prepared for me to make a near post run in the corner. I saw my marker um, guess into the front post because he knows that that's where I'm going. So yeah. I fake that, run around the back, 
you know, again, at the same time, because I know that he's predicted that because I'm prepared. He's going to think that I get a free thing. Ashley Young, who now again went on to play for Manchester United, yeah. England, he whips in an incredible cross because that was one of the things he brought to the team. He was on all set piece deliveries and uh, uh, yeah. And, and then you score the goal and, and the crowd goes crazy. You know, you're in a neutral stadium. There's 80, 75,000 people there. You know what I mean? And, and for me, it was like this crazy blackout moment. Like I hardly remember it. And the one thing I remember, it was like me, like at the top of the box with my teammates around me, like getting pumped up. Like the moment of that thought of hitting the head header to that moment, I don't even remember. <laughs> and, um, but again, we were such a well-oiled machine that we got into 1-0 at halftime. Again, we were so dominant in that game and then scored two goals in the second half and, and famously won. 3-0 beat leads and there we were my just in my second season and I'm a Premier League soccer player and no one in America has ever heard of me yeah <laughs> that was the craziest thing but that's it was it's truly what happened yeah um that just goes to show when AD Boothwood came in like did y'all had y'all signed any players uh that summer going into that season or was that you know, the reason that y'all got so much better, I mean, did that mainly come down to Boothwood? It did. It did. But again, I think he really, he really played the parts very well. He knew young, hungry guys like me would just be good contributors and workers. He knew like the leaders like Malky and our goalkeeper. And then he, re he really used the, uh, the loan program. So again, the goalkeeper oh, was yeah. a guy named Ben Foster who went on and now is mm -hmm. still playing. He's back at Watford now. But at the time he was on loan from Manchester United. We had a guy on loan from Tottenham. Um, we had, um, again, a couple older guys that had played in the Premier League before, but were now championship level players. And again, there was enough of a perfect storm where it didn't actually, none of us were out of our characters to get to that moment. Yeah. Um, but it definitely changed because then we were a Premier League team and we were like, okay, like that's when you need the money. Because what I learned very quickly in the Premier League is that it's the best league in the world for a reason. Yeah. And, and you know, and those guys, and you play Chelsea or Arsenal or Manchester United, and it's just like, you're playing not just the – you're really playing the best of the best because that's what I really appreciate about clubs. You know, it's – Manchester United isn't, you know, the, the Netherlands national team. It's the best guy on the Netherlands national team and the best guy <laughs> on England's national team and yeah. the best guy on Spain's national team and the best guy on America's national team. So if you think about the club level, it's almost better than the international level. Yeah. It's different. But if you look at the talent you have to play against every week in the Premier League – it was, it was like, it was so exciting for me, but certainly like the biggest challenge of like, holy shit, like I got to play against Drogba this week. Holy shit. I got to play against Henri next week. Oh my God. I got to play against, you know, Wayne Rooney next week. Like Jesus. for me, it was awesome because I was so excited. Like I hardly slept that year because I was just so excited to play against these players and challenge myself, but it didn't make it easy. Like, again, we got relegated very quickly. Yeah. Um, but thankfully I got to play. I played the most games I played in a Watford shirt that season. So again, for my experience to be a part of, uh, you know, the national team, that really, really helped me get in the door for the U.S. Because, you know, I walked into that U.S. door, actually a seasoned player. And that was really rare, too, from like my path in the U.S. national team. Yeah. You know, anytime that you come through and get your first cap as a national team or a player, usually like you're an MLS product or an academy, you're in a Germany academy and you haven't really played at that level yet. But I was like starting for Watford. I had already been captained in a, in a, in a Premier League game. Do you know what I mean? And then I walk into my first U.S. national team cap, but I could have the confidence to be a part of that Tim Howard, Boca Negra crew because yeah. I had played against them the week before in the Premier League. You, you know what I mean? So it was yeah. like, you know, we always have to kind of measure our confidence levels as to our experience. You know, I think confidence is gained through our experience and our results. So I still come into a U.S. national team with humility because I hadn't played for that team before, mm -hmm. but I still could carry a certain amount of confidence to know that I had been and played at that level before in my day job. So again, I think for the U.S. national team, once I got my opportunities there, which almost took two years, I was sitting on the bench behind Carlos and, and guys like Jimmy Conrad and guys that were good and, and players that were ahead of me mm -hmm. in their hierarchy of getting a national team spot. But again, it takes time. But my, my story in a lot of different ways says, when I get to that one moment of opportunity to get to that next level, I'm able to really take advantage of that situation. And that means I'm, I'm able to take advantage of that situations because I'm so prepared for it. I'm ready for it. And I really believe that I deserve to be there. So therefore I can take confidence in creating that performance. 
So that really allowed me to, and again, that's me moving into Chicago and, and getting a chance to be a defender. That's me taking a chance on myself to go to England, me walking and learning how to be a good English soccer player, but then getting a tryout with the one professional team to change my life. And I do it in that one moment. And then it's now you're a Watford player and you get to play against the best players in the world, but yet you play 30 games and you do it. And then you get to play in one game to make you the, one of the best players in the world and you, and you, and in, a, in front of 70,000 people in a situation you've never been through, but you do it. So it's like, that's five moments. That's it. Five moments and thousands and thousands and thousands of days of work yeah. for real. But again, why do you, why do, why do all five of those work? Why do all five of those, you do it. It's because you have the mindset to take advantage of that situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I mean, would you say the biggest step from the championship to the premier league was just the, the talent and then the speed? Yeah. And, and I think it's just the, it, the talent for sure. The skill level. I mean, the championship physically is harder huh. because it's elbows, it's tedders, it's more direct. It's guys killing each other for real. Like, it, you know, the English championship is a very physical league. Yeah, proper English football. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> Anyone that watches proper English football knows what that's like. Or like, <laughs> you look at the lower, comp, you know, the lower teams like Stoke or, you know, Watford, or, you know, some of those like that come up and down. A lot of times it's a little bit more direct and, and, and stuff like that. So um, that was kind of a, a big difference. But for me on, on the, on the switched on side was the big difference. And most of the time you, the game slows down in the middle third or in the middle part. So the park, so as a defender, I could take a step, I could pass it into my center mid, I could get it back. I could, you know, the passing is a little bit more relaxed, but in the in the in the boxes for corners and set pieces and and, and, and end of play, that stuff is crazy. Like, cause you gotta be so switched on. Because yeah. if you give Drogba one second and one chance to have a near post header in the 88th minute, he's the best player in the reason in the world because nine times out of ten he scores it. Yeah. So that's the difference between the Premier League and say the championship. Because in the championship or in the MLS, one out of four times, one out of five, maybe six times, that player is going to score it. <laughs> yeah. And you get away with it as a defender. But the Premier League is so cutthroat to the level of talent that if you switch off for a second, they're going to punish you. And, and they do that with their subs. They do that with their talent. They do that with the, you know, their, you know, their ability to like do it every day. That's the consistency side of being high performance too. And the guys that are starting for Manchester United have figured that out. They mm -hmm. figure out how to be the best player in the world every week because that's what you are when you play for Manchester United. Yeah. So it's like that, that's the level where you, you, it's, you can see the big jump. Gotcha. Um, well, I mean, that, like you said, you, you, you captained uh, Watford during that season. Um, and I read that, you know, you were, you were vice captain for a while and then you rotated as the captain between two other guys before John Eustace came in and took the armband. I mean, why didn't, Adrian Boothroyd really just give it to one guy. Um, and did that frustrate you? You know, why didn't – did it frustrate you that you didn't take the armband and keep it? Um, it did a little bit, yeah. But, you know, I think I understood because my results at the time when I had the armband weren't as good as when I did or huh. when I didn't. So when we were rotating, it was, it, was, it was good because, again, I was now only in my fourth season – Right. So I didn't, I didn't know if I was ready to take the reins. I think again, once you, cause again, when you, when you take a captaincy, it's a very different thing, especially in a place like that. And, and you have to wear not just, I got to play well on Saturday hats. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, that's the truth when you're a yeah. player, but when you're a captain, you got to wear your community hat on Tuesday. Cause you got to go to the hospital. You got to, you got to do interviews every day, especially at that level. You got to do interviews every day. Because you're the captain, and you're this outlet wants to do it, and this Premier League thing, Premier League lives here this afternoon. You got to go do the interview. You got to, oh Jay, the the mirror is on the phone. You got to go talk about this week's matchup against Manchester United. You got to, you guys have lost three games in a row, and now the press wants to know. You got to go to the fan forum because the the fans are pissed off, and now they're like, oh, you got to, you know, again, you got to, and you got to wear all this stuff because yeah. you got to be in it. You yeah, gotta, you're you know, the face of the club, more or less. Exactly, and you you're responsible to be the bridge between the fans, the players, the coaches, and the administration. So if you think about that, and again, it's always nice for me to kind of 
you know, spell that role out because mm -hmm. it does remind me how complicated that is. And if I'm only in my third season and my only role so far is be play good on Saturday guy, it's, you know, again, it's different. different. Yeah. So I don't know if I was ready for it, but again, part of my own ability and humility to accept and be the top dog and then get demoted was cool. I can, I didn't like it at the time, but it definitely made me learn a lot about leadership and about yeah. acceptance and about just this ability to be a team player and to, to accept criticism or to at least be humble of your own critique. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't playing well at the games where I had the cap seat because I was too busy worrying about forward guy and how I'm preparing him for the game instead of how I was preparing for me. Cause yeah. I saw him pissed off on Friday and I know that he's pissed off and he's going to carry that into the game. And now I got to go talk to him for 20 minutes to set, settle him down. Cause that's my job. My job as the leader is to make sure I'm getting the most out of 10 to 15 guys on a Saturday. And I got to play well myself. <laughs> so again, that's where the real dynamic of being a captain really it comes into play. So mm -hmm. I don't regret it. I love the experience, but at the time I didn't really like it. Got it. Um, what were you doing in England at the time you earned your first uh, call up to the U S national team in 2007? <laughs> um, I remember I was at training and I ended up getting the email. Oh, okay. um, uh, that because what, what happens when you get called up for the national team you first get an email from like the G, like the manager mm -hmm. like the gm that uh, of like player personnel to start start work, talking about travel arrangements where you're coming from what else do you need and then think uh, maybe a day or two later is when bob called me uh bob bradley who was the yep. manager at the time um yeah and he called me and, and you know just to say like you know i'm excited to have you in i know it's your first time you've come through a long way um, but again, fam famously, the story around that is two days after that, I pulled my groin in training. <laughs> no way. And I, uh, yeah, this is, this is when I give the nutrition talk to, to kids about how, <laughs> how important nutrition is to healing your body. So I'll, I'll, I'll give the real Cliff Notes version of this story, but uh, we're, we are talking about the first cap. And two days later, I, 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 I tear my groin and I, uh, I'm freaking out because I'm 10, you know, 10 days away from being called in my first national team camp. Everyone knows how long it's taken me to get here. 27 years old. Um, and I've been wanting this for a while and I'm deserving it. You know what I mean? So yeah. my, my, I go to the doctor cause I'm like, I need to know what's going on in there. Cause I got to tell the physios, you know what I mean? So they go to the doctor, I get an MRI that day, grade two tear in my, my groin. Um, generally that's a two week fix. So I'm, I'm supposed to meet up with the team in 10 days. So I'm like, I don't have that kind of time. Physio says, I just did my master's degree. And one of the things I did, one of my theses on was nutrition and foods that have anti-inflammatory properties. <laughs> so he's like, I'll make a menu of only anti-inflammatory foods. And you're going to go on that because when our bodies, when our bodies officially get like muscle tears, it, your body's bleeding, right? So it's like, it's a tear. It's your body's trying to have, your body has trauma. You have to, you have to ice it. You have to, but you're not really supposed to take Advil and things like that because it actually thins your blood mm -hmm. so that actually Im impairs the healing process so he's like this is only a 72 hour thing but for the first three days i only want you to eat these foods and i had a full menu from like ginger fresh ginger tea to pineapple blueberries seeds greens like fresh ginger like there's all sorts of in interesting things mm -hmm. and uh, uh four days later i went to the same doctor and I got the same MRI and I went from a grade two to a grade one. Wow. What? And, I had, and I had six days before I was supposed to leave. So I call Bob and I'm like, Hey Bob, this is the plan. Here's my physio. This is what's going on. Cause this was a two leg camp. We met in Tampa first and then we went to, uh, um, to Dallas actually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, and so I was like, Bob, I don't know if I'll be fit, but he's like, if you can be fit for the second game in Texas, you I'll bring you in because I just want to meet you and see you and watch yeah. you train. See, you know what I mean? That's all part of the process too. So, uh, uh, yeah, that, those, that diet really allowed me to heal in time to go get my first cap. And then I, I didn't play that first game in Tampa, but was able to get my first cap against uh, Guatemala the following week. Very cool. Um, I mean, I feel like, getting called up to the national team that's got that's got to be the ultimate honor as a player to represent your country um I, that and just from what from where you started and then to get called up to the national team that's just that's amazing yeah you know and i think 
you know, again, and this is kind of the whole idea of the story. You know what I mean? It's like when I left Green Bay, Wisconsin, as a 17 year old kid that just believed he could be a good college soccer player. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't thinking about being a U.S. national player. And I think it's important that people, you know, they fail before they even start because they think that they're going to college soccer players. They think that they're going to be Lionel Messi before they even get to college. (laughs) Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it's important for, and again, this is my, not only my experience that proves this is it going to creates the message, but you know, I think that was always in my head. It's like, I want to be this. I want to do this. And I think I might be able to, but what can I do right now? And I think the national team was a great example of that. You know, I never tried to be a national team player until I was in the mindset to do it. You know what I mean? And once I was, there became such an obsessive goal because I knew I could. But again, because I was playing pro in a first division league in England and I was starting every week and I was contributing and I was becoming a leader in that locker room. And I knew I could transfer that into the national team, but it took so long to get there and, and, and so much experience and mindset stuff. And and, uh, and just getting better every day at my skills and, and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's always important to note in, in this story about, you know, again, getting to the point where you get to be one of 11 to represent your country. Like, that's crazy. But again, there's no greater honor. But again, it takes so much time, effort, and hours to get to that point. So, yeah, I would agree that you can't get better than that. Yeah. And I, again, the, the, the best moment, the, everyone asks, like, what's the best moment you've ever had on a soccer field? And for me, it was it was standing on the halfway line with the hand, my hand on my heart, England, USA, representing my country in a World Cup. You know what I mean? Like that that is the ultimate moment. It really is. It can't you can't beat that. That's so that's so, so incredible. Um, so you won. You guys won the Gold Cup in 2007, um, qualified for the Confederations Cup in 2009, where y'all narrowly lost out to Brazil 3-2 in the final. But you played in one of the biggest victories in still to this day U.S. soccer history during that tournament, beating that that infamous Spain team 2-0. And that Spain team is regarded as one of the best teams of all time. And, you know, the fact that you guys went in there, beat them totally against the odds, and, you know, they kept a clean sheet. And then after the game, the Barcelona Daily uh, sports newspaper said that you were superb against Spain. Like the fact that the Spanish press singled you out, I mean, that, that's a, a pretty big deal. Well, yeah. And again, this is, this is what I mean about measuring your own results because that would be considered as result. Somebody else prints in their paper that you did well. Right. If that doesn't create my confidence to be a starter on that team, nothing else can. And that's not ego, that's truth. And so that was kind of where I started to live. It's like, I didn't expect myself to be a national team starter to go from a Watford starter to, you know, again, I know what time that takes. Mm -hmm. But again, when I started to play in those games, and then again, I played well, and then you get the validation. Then I'm like, now I take that into the next camp and go, okay, I deserve to start for this team. I can take the confidence in to make a difference now. And again, that's kind of what, what, where I started to gain a lot of my confidence is that I, I know I've come a long way, but I do deserve to be here now. And I think a lot of times that do, players that do come that far and who do have the journeyman story, I think sometimes we think enough's enough and like, oh, I made it this far. But again, the mindset doesn't change. And, and that for me was always a, maybe a skill of mine is that I, I, I was able to always reset to say, I'm now deserve to be in this room. Yep. So give me another room. You know, there is no ceiling. Yeah. There isn't, because there isn't. I, I don't believe there is in anyone's capabilities. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that there is. Mm-hmm. And again, if I can't be living proof of that, I don't know what it is. But, you know, again, that, and that's what we teach to our youth, is that you shouldn't, ceilings are only put on by other people or yourself, really. And, and, and um, I think that time in the U.S. where I could kind of put my stamp on it was, was great. And, 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 Again, one way to do that very quickly is to have your fourth start ever for the national team against Spain. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? And that ended up being so. Yeah. I had one start in a cap, which we use a lot of new guys. I had had a come on appearance um, of sub a couple times. And I had a couple Gold Cup starts against, you know, Barbados. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't. My first start was Brazil. Second one was Egypt. And third was... Um, uh, Brazil again, or sorry, third was Spain, and then it was Brazil again in the championship. So again, you talk about sink and swim, and you talk about baptisms of fire. These are certainly them, but you talk about learning fast and gaining confidence quickly. 
these are ways you can do that in your life. And, 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 I, and that was an example of mine. And so then again, I very quickly was like, I'm a starter on this team. World Cup's next year. Let's go. Yeah. Um, what made, I mean, you said you, you had only started a couple games before that Spain game. What made Bob Bradley, I mean, he must have had tons of confidence in you to, you know, roll you out in the starting lineup against that Spanish team. Well, yeah, and you have to remember, famously, I started those first two games because Carlos Bocanegra was injured in the Gold Cup final. Got it. So, or not the Gold Cup, yeah, it was the Gold Cup final. And so that's what got me the start from in the first place. But, and this is why I will always appreciate Bob Bradley, was that he understood that my relationship with Gooch for those first three games was really good. The partnership was working. We were complimenting each other well. And he's like, he didn't have to go with, me because I wasn't a name I was a new player I was uh, as far as my, my starting experience but he didn't and, and, and I always respect him for that and, and what he did is he moved Boca Negra to left back and then that solidified yeah. the back four and and again that's when our some of our most famous and I'm not saying it was me I'm saying I became a piece of a back four that really was good from Tim Howard Steve Trendolo Gooch and, and, and Boca Negra left back we all complimented each other well Bocanegra, who was better on the ball, was my left foot outlet to get it to him, to get it to whatever. I was able to compete and be a menace and be competitive, to compliment Gooch, who liked to win everything in the air. Yeah, huge. And have stead, steady Eddie Steve in the front, or starting on the right side, just doing eight out of ten performances every week. And then you got Tim owning his, his box behind us. <laughs> we were a good team, man. We were a yeah. good, oh, good yeah. team. And we knew it. We, we had confidence in each other. You know, what I mean? you know what I mean? Like, we all had a, this kind of chips on our shoulders. You know, I kind of I, – I don't like to call it a chip on a shoulder. I just – I like to call it, like, a renegade spirit. You know, like, I'm kind of like the renegade spirit guy. Like, get me out there, dude. I'm going to step yeah. on your toe. I'm going to disrupt you. I'm going to be – I'm going to be a nuisance because I got the opportunity to do that, and I got energy for that. <laughs> and that's why I love playing against good players and good teams because I could do that, and I could test Fernando Torres and, and – uh you know, fight with uh, Puyo on corners and like, you know what I mean? Just be in there, be in there doing what I do. And, 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 and I think that's one of the big qualities I brought to that team. And, um, but again, we had a different position in a bunch of ways. And I think that's what Bob was really good at was picking yeah. guys that really fought for each other and cared about each other and, and really just stayed in their lanes and did a good job of what they were supposed to bring into the team. And I think that's what Bob was really masterful at and one of his best attributes as a coach. And, and, and again, I always appreciate that because I, I, I saw what I was, what he saw in that team. And, and, and again, I, I think that there is a reason we had some of the best results we ever had. No, no, there's no question. I mean, that I, st I mean, still today, that um, U.S. team from like 2009 and then, you know, especially the 2010 uh, World Cup, that is my favorite U.S. team. I mean, just w the, the chemistry between between the players, the, the effort, you know, I think that was big. I know um, Bob Bradley talked about going into the World Cup, the, the never die attitude you know, and, and uh, y'all just never threw in the towel. And teams, is, you know, especially like Spain, they hated it. They, you, yeah. they, you just would not give up. And that, and, and, and that was always, again, I think built into the core of the players that he selected. But again, a lot of times when you're not giving up, it's not because you're – it's because you're fighting for each other. Do, do you know what I mean? And I think Bob built that mindset by the guys he picked. And it was just like – we all kind of had this silent fight for each other too. And again, I think that showed in our actions and in that ability to do it every week or the ability to keep going through the 92nd minute so we can score against Algeria or to be so compact as an 11 to not give Spain a breath. Yeah. Because that's what we did. We, 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 we combined, you know, we cut down their space in their final third. We condensed it. We had Ricardo and Mike in front of us as center backs. We were cutting down that space and being annoying and Gooch and those, the, the little forwards up there from Torres and, and David Villa, me and Gooch could affect them physically. Yeah. You know what I mean? We were annoying. We were, you know, we, we, we were good on set pieces. You know, that kind of stuff really transferred into what each of us brought into the team. And um, I think, again, we, I think we all kind of love that about our, that squad. And, and again, the pieces changed from time to time. Again, a lot of those pieces did. And, and again, moving into that World Cup was, you know, I guess Slovenia game, again, being a great example. 
and then yeah, subsequently exactly. the big, big one from beating Algeria. And I don't know if you want to talk about that in its own segment, but yeah, you know that that's what led us to those performances. Yeah, um, and yeah, I, I did want to hit on that real quick. I mean, that game against Algeria still one of the best moments of my life. I can't. I the room I was in was you know losing it. I can't even imagine what it was like on the field. Like that was such it an amazing moment i'll go back to it on youtube and watch the uh the reactions from the u.s fans and bars and wherever and you know losing their oh, yeah. shit we could hear that even in south africa i swear <laughs> <laughs> that was such a, i mean just thinking about it now it gives me the jills uh it was such an incredible moment for u.s that? soccer um man uh, yeah it was, it was great but i read in that algeria game um, did you play most of that game with a split tongue? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> there's a couple of injury stories that are that are like totally not even in my story because it's just like we couldn't fit them in there. <laughs> but that one is uh, uh, is a good one. And, and I, I, this one was, again, you know, we're going into Algeria. It's all up for grabs in Group C. If any of us that win our, our last game, you know, England-Egypt was a good matchup we knew that, or I mean, England, um, um, Sylvania. Uh, Sylvania was a good matchup. We knew that they could give them a, 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 a good run. We knew that we could beat Algeria if we did our jobs. Um, we knew that hopefully we could keep them scoreless because, you know, we had a pretty good clean sheet record minus the Sylvania two goals in that crap moment of us kind of all switching off and it kind of woke us back up. Yep. But the whole idea of that was, uh, was to keep going. Because if we win, we win. If we win, we win our group. If we win, we win in our group. So I think that was built into our code of how we got to that 90-second minute moment. And, uh, and, but unfortunately for me, in the third minute, uh, our forward came in from the side, elbowed me in the face off a goal kick, and I chomped down on my tongue. And I basically I split my tongue that, that way. Oh, God. And uh, so I get from my teeth. So I run out, I start, I'm, I know I'm, I know I'm in trouble and I, I'm starting instantly spitting blood and I'm I go over to the physio Ivan and I'm like, what's going on? And I pull my tongue across and I see his face and he's like, holy shit. He's like, he's like, okay, uh, we got a big, you got a big cut in your tongue. You know, do you want to come off or what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Can I play? He's like, well, if you want to play, you know, he's like, I can't stay. He's like, that's going to need stitches. But if you, if you want to play, you can play. So I'm like, okay. Well, I'm, again, this is U.S. Algeria. I'm not letting a split tongue stop me from, you know what I mean? Come on, man. Like, you know my story. I'm not going to do that. I love uh, it. I'll have no tongue before I come off of that. Yeah. Field. You, you know what I mean? So um, that's kind of, so every 10 or 15 minutes, I would go over to the sidelines and you would put like Vaseline in it so it wouldn't bleed so profusely. Um, and then I just got back to business. And again, I, my business is very simple on those, on those, in those teams, you know, again, I know what I'm good. Again, I say this all the time, but it, it is true. You know, at that level, it, it, your game becomes simpler mm -hmm. and I knew what I was good at. I knew what I could do. And I knew I could do that with a split tongue for sure. I can do that. I can win headers. It hurts. Yeah. Give me some, you know, some Advil and to help my, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I get it. So we get to halftime, we get there and he's like, okay, well, what do you think? We, there's not enough time to stitch this to stitch it up because the stitch it, I think it was like four stitches it was going to require. So again, I was like, okay, we're, 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 we're almost there. Even right now, the England game, if we tie, we're through, I'm going out there. We're doing it again. So we get back through again. We, we do what we're good at. We get to the 92nd minute. Tim famously throws it, throws yeah. the, mm -hmm. the ball out to land it. Everyone knows it's a, it's a ricochet. Uh, from Clint's, you know, ability and bravery to go in and take down that challenge with the keeper. Landon gives it, gives the tap into the far left corner, which again, it wasn't as easy as people thought it was. Cause if you would have put it right back into the middle of the goal, the goalie might've been there, yeah. but he found that corner very simple, you know, as Landon would do. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yeah, then the, it, you know, the celebration ensued and <laughs> you can see me come from all the way back yeah, you and I rolled I, over I the, the dog pile the stalls over the top. Cause again, <laughs> I'm the last one there because I'm the center back and Tim didn't come. So, he, you know, I'm there and I'm doing a somersault over the <laughs> narrowly, narrowly missed, like studying our physio in the head yeah. on top of the dog pile. And uh, yeah, final whistle blows. I'm in the locker room 
finally getting my tongue stitched up and uh and and bill clinton walks in with a cooler of Budweiser. no way and like we we all share like my, again my bill clinton moment is me with a swollen tongue out of my mouth like i can't even talk <laughs> having beers with bill with like with my shirt off in the locker room like taking pictures <laughs> with bill like you know what i mean like having beers and with, with the press so yeah it was you know again like, like it made that moment of like sacrifice pain endurance will all those things were like built into that moment for me so even more personally with the with the tongue story but yeah again these are moments that we have to go through to understand what those things are you, yeah. you know what I mean? So I, I think I looked at that Algeria game again as, as one of those real moments of will and endurance. And then you look to Spain as like my moment of like true high performance. So like you look at all of the scenarios we're fortunate enough to have in our lives. And I think that that shapes our character. Mm -hmm. um, and then you guys moved on um, to the round of 16 against Ghana, who – I feel like a lot of people overlooked that Ghana team. That Ghana team was really good, and they should have made the semifinals if it weren't for Suarez handballing it. Um, what did, what was it that that they did? I mean, like, how did they beat you? You know, I know they won two one, but what was it that they did that like threw you off? Um, well, again, it was one one going into extra time. It was a mm -hmm. pretty, pretty even matchup. Yeah, um, and they had a couple chances. We certainly had enough chances to get a goal. Um, but we didn't. And, and again, that happens. That's the run of the game. That's run of play. That's, that's everything. And it, I think at the end, it just came down to they took their chance and chances and we did it. Yeah. Um, again, the, the goal, um, it's awesome. I always tell the kids about dealing with disappointment. And one of the things that stories that I tell is, is, is I have this like calcium deposit on the top of my kneecap from when I slid in late to try to stop that, you know, Gian yeah, I remember that very dynamic forward he was like literally one of the most scouted players after the world cup and again you're right like that Ghana team was incredible oh yeah you, know, you had Botangs and the, the you know the delivery people you had Gian up front very athletic fast jump out of the gym you know these are the kind of guys we were playing with and again I think we we, we were very evenly matched I think it could have gone either way but in that last and, and the goal that he scored on his uh his wind up he studded my knee as I came into the end and and I had this big like egg on the top of my kneecap from that game. And it, it kind of solidified to this like raised calcium scar on the top of my kneecap. But it's like at that moment, it was like the worst because we could have won that game. That puts us in U.S. soccer history into a whole new stratosphere. Yep. And it gives us an opportunity to be what we think we are. But the disappointment of that is like now we're out. And I, now I have to remind myself of this for the rest of my life. But at the end of the day, like this, I always talk about dealing with disappointment, but the fact is, is I tell that story is because at least I get to tell the story. I got to be in a world cup where somebody yeah. else won, but I could look at that as a failure and a disappointment. But at the end of the day, that scar is a symbol of how far you can go. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? So this is kind of like, these are the ways that I kind of develop my story into kind of trying to create mindsets for people that are trying to create their own journeys. If you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. um so i mean what would you say was y'all's you know identity or style of play during that world cup like how did bob bradley prepare you guys and, and yeah how did he want you guys to play um solid at the back closing down with midfield front um uh guys like Joe the elder and clint dempsey who could kind of make plays on their own at times uh, set piece quality. Yeah. Um, because Gooch was good in the air. We had a couple good guys that, that were good in the air. Boca Negra is very good in the air. Um, you know, I could be a nuisance in the box. Yeah. You weren't bad Trundle, yourself. <laughs> Trundle and Trundle and like those kind of guys were good kind of safety nets. Um, and, it, and I think that was kind of us. And, and, and there were a couple guys that could chop and change into that, you know, like the center midfielders from like, you could put on Jose Torres instead of Ricardo, depending on which player they were playing against. Mm -hmm. You know, if we wanted to be more defensive, Ricardo would come in. He was the one that would really cut the space because he was rangy yeah. and he could cut space quickly. If we thought that we could win the ball in the midfield and, Ho and Torres could take the ball and thread the needle to Josie, who's on somebody's shoulder with his strength and his speed, that's the way we would go. So I think yeah. Bob really had his parts. He had his guys that really played those parts. And again, I think that was one of his skills. You know what I mean? Like he made 
he made good players do do well on the field because all we had to do was our jobs. And, and, and I think because he really personified what those jobs meant by his research and the way he – I mean, he was, we always used to joke that Bob would have his little DVD screen, like, Velcroed to his forehead. <laughs> if he would come into our meal rooms, and like, we wouldn't even see him. He'd just be glued to the thing, watching tape and watching the – you know what I mean? Like, preparing and trying to figure out what formation he wanted to play. And it was kind of like this funny, like – anti-social way that we kind of made fun of him you know what I mean but it, was like, <laughs> but it totally showed and like the way he in the in-depth ways that he kind of built his teams for each performance mm -hmm. um just real quick if you were in charge of the U.S. men's national team what would you do I mean can you talk you know a little bit about the program what you think needs to be done to take the program to the next level uh, what are we doing right where are we falling short um, of how our system was organized, player development. Uh, can you just kind of I mean, what, what are your thoughts on the the U.S. national team right now and the you know the the system? Sure. Well, I, I think we're all naturally. I'm going to take this lightly. Underwhelmed with yeah. where we're at. Um, yeah. Do I think it's it's something that definitely needs fixing? One hundred percent. If I'm not an alumni that cares about this team and how and its performances, you know, I, I, I would be a fool to, to not be critical of certain parts. You know what I mean? Not only in my own experience, but just in my own now being a not product system is that I, I, to answer your question, what I think the system is now is that it's a system that's been created on pretty, I look at the, what are, what are the, what are the, who are the guys that are turned out? So if you think about a system in a manufacturing plant, you take all these pieces and then you, in the end, this, this product gets churned out of the system. I think one of the biggest problems is that the product right now is very similar to the person that was before them and after them. You're getting academy products that are pretty one dimensional. Their egos are pretty in that built on their own development of who they are. They are building us. They are players that are built into a system that says you are this. And I think that sometimes the players have an identity crisis of what they bring to the team and who they actually think they are as players. But I think the systems themselves, and this is why I go back to it's not the players, it's the system, is that I think our system is creating those players. These are kids that generally come from high-performance programs, i.e. pay-to-play systems. So people like myself and Clint Dempsey are harder to find. But Clint Dempsey and I were character players. And again, Clint Dempsey are much more you know, a well-rounded player and a talent level. But again, my mindset in this ability to be a cowboy in a position where I could be renegade and go and take on a Spain with confidence and be like, yo, let's do this, really allowed us to have those performances against teams like Spain. And I don't see enough of that dynamic mm -hmm. in the current squad. They are on paper better players than I ever was, 100%. But on a skill set level, but as far as like what you can bring to a team to be American and to continue to get good results is being fallen by the wayside. And again, if you want to talk about confidence should be based on results, what are the results that the U S national team has been playing and had over the last years? Jurgen had some, but not enough to change the system to want it. And I don't think he used enough American players to actually create an American system. And that's no disrespect to the players that he brought in. They were all great players. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about the ability to wear a cape for the U.S. national team and to be purposeful in what we're trying to create as a nation, we need dudes from Texas that are yeehaw. We need a <laughs> corn-eating kid from Wisconsin. We need a little, a little Mexican background kid that, that can pick passes and bring his flair into the national team. We need a tough mountain guy that's up front and throwing his elbows like Brian McBride used to do. <laughs> we need the guy that's a part of the Academy system. That is Michael Bradley and really, really good at his job. And he comes to work every day and he's got influence and he he's been there for 15 years because he was playing in the MLS when he was 14. And we need those guys too. Don't get me wrong. Those are probably the most important part to the system because guys like me should only be one or two. You shouldn't have 11 guys like me. I mm -hmm. get it. You shouldn't have 11 guys like Clint. You shouldn't have 11 guys like Landon. But at the end of the day, when you mix all of those characters because your system creates them, now you have an opportunity to be an American national team that's going to go and beat Spain.
Exactly. And that is where I think the biggest, let's just sit here in our biggest perspective and point out problems. That is for me, my biggest perception of why the U S national team isn't getting the results that we all want, including the current national team players, managers, and system. Mm-hmm. I, you know, again, we're not doing this on purpose. We all want to win. We all want to be a, proud Americans it's built into our code but we're I do believe that this is one of the biggest problems yeah um and that's why it's so frustrating because you know in 2010 like I said I love that team um it just it had a little bit of everything the players you know worked really well together and then you know now to not make the world cup losing to Trinidad it was really disappointing because I know the talent is here in the U.S. It's here, but they're not getting found. Like, they didn't find you because if you're not paying to play, if you're not in the academy, the scouts aren't going to find you. And that's where we're wrong. In Brazil, there's a kid playing in the streets, and, you know, that is his way out. He has to play soccer. That's the only thing he can do. And they'll drag him, you know, and he makes a national team. But in the U.S., it's like if you're not, in, you know, playing in the academy, a D1 college, like the chances of you – making it to the national team are very slim and that's wrong. Yeah. And I would agree with that, 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 that whole concept. And again, I'm not trying to, you can't go and kill the system. You can't go and do that. The idea is to implement better programs that will allow the grassroots players to be found. So create right. different nets, not create the net. And I think that that is one of the ways in the developmental systems that we can start to implement. I'm not saying you change the whole system. That's just stupid. Why would you do that? You spent 30 years building it. Mm-hmm. The idea is why do we, again, if you look at the end product, and again, I look at that end product is when the going gets tough, how many U.S. national players are going to, you know what I mean, roll, run through a brick wall? Well, if they've never run through a brick wall because they've had their food prepared for them since they were 12, yeah. they've, never, they've never lost a game. They've never been sitting on a bench in a team that they had to deserve to be on. They've never been not picked. They've always been told how good they are. They come from good supportive families and backgrounds, so they don't have a chip to perform because they know that if they lose, mom and dad are still going to love them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like These are all reasons why when you get to those big moments of how do you qualify for world cups or how do you beat Spain or score in the 92nd minute, those are moments of will experience guys that are willing to take on those experience because they'll die for them because of their stories to survive or to make it or to do all that stuff. That's how you create the characters of the 11 that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. This This is experience that does that. But right now, what is the experience of a current U S national team player? Think about that for a second. You've been an academy product. You always get to wear the track suit, which costs a bunch of money. Your brand awareness is everywhere. You've got 4,000 followers. You've got, you know what I mean? These are all the kids that show up in the system. And then they go up against the dude from Costa Rica who's, you know, dad is a, is a, is a salt merchant and is, is played on dirt since he was 12. And he, yep. he, he's trying to fight for his family's, livelihood and he's got a scout in the stands from Sunderland and he he's never even thought that he could play for England but now he's getting this scouting opportunity you think that dude is going to go into that performance and kill it and beat us U.S. national team players right now the answer is yes and this is what happened in Trinidad exactly so again when you talk about this stuff this is why in my opinion Mm mm-hmm yeah, that's and that was uh that was you know maybe mad too you know the fact that they were even in that situation in the first place like okay you got to win in Trinidad to get in like you know they lost but they shouldn't have even they should have qualified before they went there and then they lose and you see the players complaining about the grass <laughs> you know it's so like th- exactly if you are in the mindset of survive at all costs grass is not a factor <laughs> yeah. It's not. It's yeah. just not. To the mindset of that idea to go and win is not a factor. You could play in concrete park. And again, certain personalities would go out there and slide in it. Exactly. Yeah. If, yeah. if it means I qualify for a World Cup, I know those Trinidad players would do that. I know Honduras players would do that. You know what I mean? They would slide on concrete to qualify for a World Cup. I, I don't know if. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I get the other side. And again, by no means am I saying that our players are not good enough. Don't ever, anyone that ever sees this and listens to it, say, think mm-hmm. that, that I'm saying that or sitting on a high horse going, you guys suck. That is not the point. The point is, how do you create an environment where you go to Trinidad and win at all costs? It takes a personality and a character to do that. And it's the system that creates the character or it's the stories of the players that are there. Mm-hmm. That creates the character that you can walk into those performances and perform. Some are from the system, great but make sure the system creates those characters. The other ones are like, again, the crazy stories that don't belong there. Again, me, who would, would die at that opportunity. So again, when you mix those dynamics, success happens. And the U.S. national team is a world contender. I guarantee it. Because the players we can find are goddamn right good enough. Of course. Mm-hmm. But it's the system that's spitting them out. And right now, they are not good enough. And that's performances and results that are telling us that straight up. That's factual. That's results. And again, if I'm, if I'm someone that creates a perspective by results and experience, then that is where kind of where my opinion lies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the team, I mean, I guess the best way to kind of summarize it, there's just a huge lack of grit in there. Um, the, the How do you coach grit? How? How do you coach it? I talk to coaches yeah, all the time. Exactly. You can't. You, you can't. One of the biggest coaches of grit ever, 90% of it is built on experience and being yeah. in uncomfortable zones and coming through adversity and, and, again, not getting picked and learning that you do get picked and you win. That's – I can do this. I can do this again, and I can keep putting myself into these uncomfortable situations. But, again, until you've done that, and, again, are we creating enough opportunities or uncomfortable situations for these guys to learn that at that level? I don't know. Are we? Probably not. Mm-hmm. That's a good question for the people in the systems. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, moving on from that, I, you know, we could talk about the U.S. men's national, you know, what they're doing all day long. But um, yeah, let's uh, let's move on from that. But so after the World Cup in the the fall of 2010, uh, the White Cap signed you as their first player and made you captain as they prepared to enter their first season in the MLS. Um, were you excited to start this new jersey? Excuse me, this new journey. And were you disappointed at all um, that Watford didn't offer you a contract extension? Did you want to stay in England? Um, I wanted to stay in Europe, potentially. But none of the options I had were good enough for me to not take the role and experience to come home to play because anyone that under, understood my story was that I moved to England on my own. I, and again, when you're over there, your parents might come a couple times a year and your brother will come and your buddies will come once or twice a year and you get to enjoy this experience with them. But for me as a 30 year old who had had all this experience, I had been in England basically on my own and, 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 and as someone that appreciates community and the, and the family and support systems and also who had learned to appreciate leadership by my experience, I was kind of ready for a change. I, I was, again, I, I, had, I had gone to as far as I could have gone at Watford because if I wanted to, if coming off a World Cup, I wanted to stay at the high league. And mm-hmm. at the time, Watford was still a championship club. So I, I, I thought I wanted to use my World Cup experience as a way to either create a role or to put myself in a whole new echelon of a uh, a team that I could re-challenge myself into do in, into being a part of. So the big opportunities didn't come. Uh, I had a chance to go to Celtic, which would have been great, but they needed to sell their center half who they tried to sell before me. And they didn't, they couldn't sell him. They didn't, uh, they wouldn't get what he, his wage was on, which is kind of with some of the inside stuff about how contracts and, and moves happen or they don't. Um, so that was one that was on the table, but I didn't unfortunately get um, but again, I don't regret the move to wa- or to Whitecaps at all. Like I, I truly believe it was a part of my journey and my path, um, because what what that opportunity allowed me to do was understand bright lights and being a role of like being the first signing of an MLS franchise is a big deal. You know, to 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 say that we want to be you 
to help with the development of our club is um, again, when I had worn the captain hat for three years at yeah. Watford and understood the role and then to come back to a place where I had my support system near me, my parents, my friends, things like this. I knew Vancouver was an incredible place, uh, you know, logistically, all those pieces just outweighed the ability to stay in Europe and make more money. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and again, the opportunities to, to challenge myself from a club level or for a club badge level, not to, again, discount Watford because I love that club. And, and, and again, those pieces weren't fitting either. The manager at Watford at the time was Melky, the guy that I used to play center half with <laughs> and the promotion season. But what happened when a man, when a player turns into a manager, they have to now take the managerial position. So what that means is that I'm no longer like a chum friend banter guy. So it's hard for players that have played with the guy that's just taken the manager role because my relationship has now changed. Mm -hmm. And so to be the captain of that club, me and Malky kind of started to have a go at each other in ways because I was of the like, like we're still on a level playing field. And he was more like, I'm your manager now. And this is, mm -hmm. and it started to affect our relationship a little bit. And we loved and respected each other enough to know that I had come to the end of my Watford journey. Um, and, and, and again, we were both under that understanding. And, and again, I was ready to challenge myself in a different environment and uh, again, kind of come home. And again, what, or the Whitecaps offered me an incredible opportunity to be a part of an MLS franchise from the start, which I found extremely interesting from a role perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, did you enjoy the MLS? I did for all of the MLS reasons. You know, MLS reasons at the time were like, and it continued to be growth. You know what I mean? To gain culture, to create culture in white cap stadiums, to re-engage and see North American soccer with 25,000, 50,000 people in Seattle. You know, that stuff was for me really, really enjoyable to see where when I left from the MLS as a undrafted <laughs> PBL player, <laughs> you know, to then to return to the growth of that for me was cool. It was, it was nice to see the MLS and where it was, but I'll at the time still knew that my role was still continued growth. And I don't think MLS is even close to his, to its growth of where it's going and where we're going to get to. But again, to be a part of that for me was a great experience. Um, again, I think the leadership role really became what I got most out of my experience. It, it didn't make me, say, for instance, a much better player from a skill mm -hmm. perspective or like challenging myself against, you know, the really good MLS players. I think I found my best challenges in a U.S. shirt and, of course, in a Watford shirt. But um, from a leadership perspective, from a, a um, you know, how do you even my, refine myself as a person and as a leader and, and as a player, you know, from, from I think the Whitecaps experience was incredible. Uh, how to manage travel. Uh, was in a white caps experience, some MLS experience. How do you manage your time? Uh, again, the, all those things are great life skills. They really are. And, and I think I learned a lot about the MLS as well and, and how now my experience and all these white, walks of life through my own programs and also working with the white caps. And I'm now the North American ambassador for Watford. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw now, that. Mm -hmm. and these, yeah. So these now play into my future roles as to my, how I can give back my experience um, for the future. So again, I, I, I love the MLS and where it's at and, 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 and how MLS franchises are really starting to become their own identity. And I love that because that's what I learned in Europe is that this isn't like an MLS run thing, even though the frustrating part from the clubs is that the MLS does kind of oversee it all, but they are starting to understand that clubs need to have their own identity and it, and it filters down into the fan identity, which now makes you buy season tickets. So it does yeah. still work. Um, but I, that refinement, it's still refining every day. You know, what's working for North American culture is very different from what works in Europe or South America. Mm -hmm. So again, I think that learning process is still there. Um, again, I like that about the MLS because I see that room for growth, but, uh, I, I do totally appreciate and, 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 and loved my MLS experience because there's so much to it. And, 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 and again, I, I love that whole leadership role of what I had to learn because I came from a world cup player and starting every minute of a world cup into <laughs> being an expansion franchise captain and losing every away game we had in our whole first season. So we didn't win an away game all year. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And I talk about the humility scale of like, Hey, come in with ego and I'm the, one of the best players in the world to 
losing every game away and being responsible for that. Yeah. Was really like on for, for like a, a leadership and humility role, like was a great experience for me. Cause I had to take it on the chin. I had to humble myself and say, I don't know why. And again, I'm impressed every day because I'm the captain of the team. And that's what happens. Captain always speaks. And, and, and I had to talk about how we sucked and how we, I don't know why we're not winning games. And I, I had two groin injuries that first year. So I was injured Yep. and like that sucked. And, you know, again, but that, again, to talk, talk about personal growth and experience and how we can do that. You know, I love that as part of my Watford or uh, uh, Whitecaps experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was about to mention, uh, I mean, how many games in that first season did you miss through your injuries? Um, I ended up playing, I think, just under half the season so i was out a lot and again right. when you're an expensive franchise you need your very few leaders that you have in the locker room and you know joe cannon john thorrington terry dunfield these are guys that were great leaders and but again we were an expansion franchise so we had brand new players that had no experience we had guys that had been no never been in our locker room before so it was really hard for all of us that leadership group to manage that first season not to mention we had three managers in our first year we had our, our first coach he was fired after the first two months we had an interim coach that ended up not getting the job. And then we had a, he had to finish the season after two months before the season was started, we hired a future manager that wasn't even ready until the beginning of the next season. What? So, so, oh, thanks buddy. My son just gave me a card with fish on it. <laughs> How about that? Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of, uh, you know, what I really liked about my, the challenges of that season. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah. I mean, cause the following season in 2012, 2013, you were healthy. The, I mean, most, the whole season. Um, right. It, yes. Yeah. And that's when I, you know, again, I, I got to make the all-star team. We, uh, right, yeah. um, um, I got voted MLS best 11 that year. Mm-hmm. Um, again, that all-star team beat Chelsea. We were one of the only all-star teams to beat, a uh, Premier League team that came to town. And, you know, again, I got to get those great experiences too. I got to play with David Beckham, Thierry Henry, D-Row. D- D- you know, these are guys that, you know, I knew were MLS All-Stars and I got to share a field with them and have an influence on, on their field too and beat teams like that. So, again, those were good confidence builders to know I still had it. I wasn't just this retired guy that wanted to come to the MLS and finish my career. <laughs> yeah. And, again, there was there was examples of that, uh, mainly from European <laughs> players, but um, – you know, again, I didn't want to be that either. And, and thankfully that second season was my, by far my best MLS season. And again, I got to be the first white cap to be an all star, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I really, again, and, and as that went in my third season, I, I ruptured my Achilles, which kind of started the whole oh. demise. I was out mainly that whole season came back, got a new contract for my fourth year. And then three months into that season, I ruptured uh, the perineal tendon off the same ankle as my Achilles. Jesus. So, you know, in the end that I knew the writing was on the wall and not only was I thankful for 10 years of, of professional service, but I was ready, you know, I was ready to say, listen, if I can't make those tackles, if I can't be that renegade out there, I, it's not for me. It's and, not and, for me. and I'm not going to be that pro that just picks a contract up. Cause to be honest, I want to use my experience for other things and, and to, you know, again, whether that's to share it to youth that are want my, that are in my position or to be a mentor for pros that are there or, you know, do other jobs and, use my design degree and do all the other stuff that I, that I did post career. So, you know, I, I really like, you know, that 10 years is such an incredible part. Sometimes you forget about it. And that's why I love doing these podcasts. Cause I just tell my story more and it makes me appreciate it even more about like the journey and where you've been, what you've done and kind of good, bad and ugly again. And I really believe that that's what journeys are. There's no such thing as a perfect journey. There's no such thing as an ill adverse journey. There isn't, it's impossible. Because even the biggest celebrities in the world, the richest people in the world will have faced adversity in their lives. And I think that that is something that we all need to take into our own stories. And, you know, I think that really allows uh, for the story to be told properly and, and for people to really know and refine their own characters enough to be better every day. And I think that that is, is, is the best part of what I got out of my, my 10 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was just going to say like, the season that season after you were injured you where you only played half the games um you know you come in i think that just showed how you know much good you were obviously a fantastic player but 
uh, your lead, you know, your presence as a leader on the field as well, because you guys finished in 11th that season, MLS all-star MLS best 11, um, you know, you only playing in half the games the season before was obviously a big blow to the team. And it showed because as soon as you came in, y'all finished in 11th, like way higher up the table. Um, so, <laughs> which I will never take full credit for. <laughs> <laughs> that is a team effort. Always, all team performances are based on team, not individuals. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I, I do appreciate you seeing that, but uh, uh, yeah, but, you know, again, and this is why I love about teams and 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 experience. You know, and I when I talk to big groups or I talk to you know conferences and stuff, that's one of the big things I try to hook onto as far as like this is a that kind of thing is a transfer of leadership it doesn't matter if you're a business or if you're a coach on a youth team when you can have leaders do their jobs and you can you can have leaders create a program that's based on adversity and grit and positivity and you know respect good things can happen like mm -hmm. you can't it doesn't matter if you're a, again a, a business person or a, or a, or a, a captain it, that leadership role is imp is so important to the team dynamic of a group and you know I, I think all of us can be leaders too it doesn't have to be the guy with the armband yeah. or the guy with the bigger job title i think it's it's about making sure that team dynamics are relatable and the leaders will always be naturally more leadership based because that's the role they that they take on but I really find in my experience, the more leaders you have in your group, the better. And that, though, that season with, 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 with the Whitecaps really taught me that. Because I got back into, I'm not going to carry this myself. I'm not going to, you know what I mean? And, I, and that's what I was doing in those times of, of some of my failures in that first season was like, I was thinking, I'm this World Cup player that needs to carry these other guys and instead of empowering them as a leader to do their jobs. And I think that's what I started to learn in that situation was try to stop taking it all on yourself and trying to be this guy that has to do everything. You know, if you can empower people by language and by, uh, you know, giving them more options to do after training or working on their skill set so that they can whip in that free kick at the time where at the end of the game, when, when it's, when you can, yeah, <laughs> because they've practiced it 20 times. And instead of saying you suck at free kicks, you go, Hey, stay with me after training every day and I'm going to, I'm going to whip in free kicks. I'll be the header on the end. And I want you to do 15 with me after training empowered young 23 year old who at that time for me was Russell Tiber, who's now still at with the white caps again, to credit to his character. Um, that's the kind of thing I started to do instead of saying, I'm a leader. I have ego. I'm trying to do this. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff is so important. And, and, and I think that was a good learning environment for me to learn that. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, just what an incredible, you know, unique career you had. Just, I don't think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think that anyone that has played for the national team has, has a story like that. I, I don't <laughs> I think you're right. Well, this is why it got turned into a film in 2011, I, I think. But um, yeah, we know again, and, and again, just to, I mean, finish up, um, I, I, I truly appreciate that. You know what I mean? I, I know what my story is and I know that it's been tumultuous. It's been gratifying. It's been the most challenging thing I've ever had to do. Mm -hmm. But again, that's what I love about it. And again, the victories along the way and the big wins and the teamwork stuff and the learning curve and the ability to create communication platforms with people even like yourself where these things are all part of it. And, and, and you know, I'm so you know, thankful for that journey. And I'm so thankful for being able to tell it. And, and, and I guess that for me is kind of where my purpose lies and how I like to kind of finish the loop on telling the story is that, you know, the story doesn't end. It, it, you know, it doesn't, this isn't like, hey, you had a great career and, you know, how was that was crazy. You know what I mean? It's like, I agree. And my career is even going to be crazier. And, I, and, and I'm going to try to use it to help find more versions of me. <laughs> and I want to use that to be the mentor for those kids. And I want to use it to create more platforms like podcasts and, you know, talk to more people like you and, you know, so you can go and spread your message in your way and, and, and affect the people that follow you. You know what I mean? That's communal. That is teamwork. That is truly what sports, commu you know, th and, and this type of thing is about. And, and, and 
you know, that's what I love about my story is that it's not perfect. It's so real. It's so like, if you're not, you know, acting crazy at times, you're not crazy enough. <laughs> not only the crazy ones do the crazy stuff. Yeah. And by crazy, I mean, awesome. End up playing the world cups, end up being the number one podcast in the world, ends up being a entrepreneur that sells a company for $10 million or becomes the scientist that cures COVID. There's a million ways you can create your own World Cup finals. There are. It's just the ability to go and find them. And, and, and that's truly what Rise and Shine is. And that's the message now. That's the youth program. We use the charity to, to raise money of community. And we use that community money to funnel in young players and, and people that want to go and try to be crazy. Because that's what we want to support. We want to support that holistic lifestyle. And, you know, it's balance. It's things. It's challenge. It's uncomfortable uncomfortable zones you know what i mean like all that stuff is all part about you know what my mindset is and where i'm just going to continue to push on a day-to-day -day basis so that's the thing stay tuned rise and shine man <laughs> yeah um well jay that's really all i had for you that was a great way to kind of cap it off um i think you got enough content for two for two podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no well, thank you uh, yeah. thank you <laughs> Uh, but no, my pleasure. And again, I'm 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 here to 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 be a part of that. So, if you, of course, if you ever need anything from me, uh, I'm right here. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jay. Okay, my pleasure. We'll see you soon. Okay.